It's good to see you here tonight. We appreciate all you being here. Hopefully you've had a great afternoon. And uh, we do have a special recognition service tonight and uh, with our kindergartners, and we're very proud of them. Um, we um, would like to welcome you if you're a guest tonight. Thank you for coming. I'd like to have a word of prayer, and then we'll move forward uh, with Brother Evan. He'll come share a few things, and we'll move immediately right into this. Now, I won't go ahead and tell you, if, if you would like to take pictures or video or whatever, it's going to be at the very beginning we're going to do the kindergarten thing. So uh, after the prayer, Brother Evan, then he's going to go into it, and he'll, uh, but I wanted you all to know if get your phones ready or your cameras ready so you can uh, get ready to take it. Hopefully you will because I know it's memories. So but let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for children. Thank you for blessing us here in New Hope with all of these children. Thank you for these students. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us a chance to invest in their life, but also they bring joy to our life. Father, we thank you for their parents. I thank you for their grandparents. Lord, I just thank you for those that teach them in all different capacities, in, in regular school and in our vacation Bible school and our Sunday school and, and at nighttime, we just thank you that you give us a window of opportunity to be able to teach them about you. And Lord, help us to see that as parents we have that responsibility, but also we have the responsibility as a church community. And I just pray you help each one of these kids as they grow, uh, Lord, that they would be able to understand more about you. And Lord, we know in time, we pray. Lord, that they would come to know you as their personal Lord and Savior if they have not already. I just pray for tonight's service as we have this special time together. We pray that your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Evan. All right, good evening. Good evening, good evening. I do just want to remind you of a few things going on in the life of the church before we, uh, before we proceed forward. Of course, we do have deacons meeting tonight immediately following... Uh, the conclusion of this worship service, as well as a variety of things happening throughout the week at our church, including the uh, Christian school program tomorrow night at 6 for the 6th through 8th graders, the, pre uh, the preschool, where is that at? There it is. The New Hope Preschool Graduation Program, uh, Wednesday at 6.30. Of course, there will be no GAs, RAs, youth, mission friends meetings that night. Everybody will be uh, required to attend that program here at the church and Thursday, 6 o'clock. Oh, and it will be in the New Fellowship Hall. Each of these programs will be in the New Fellowship Hall. And Thursday, uh, May 11th at 6 o'clock, we do have our kindergarten through fifth grade program for the New Hope Community Christian School, and it will, of course, be in the New Fellowship Hall as well. Also, we are, the youth are uh, selling T-shirts for their uh, for camp. It is not a fundraiser, but it is a shirt that we have put together that we want to wear the day we leave to go to camp. It is $12 for that shirt. It's a really uh, neat, bright shirt, and uh, very uniquely designed. You know, because I had a little bit of part in it. <clears throat> so, you know, it's got to be unique. Uh, and also, VBS. None of y'all thought that was funny. Y'all must be tired or something. And, uh, no, it was just bad humor. But, uh, and also, uh, VBS is coming. It's just around the corner, and we are ordering T-shirts for VBS as well. The cost is uh, $12, and you can come to... New Hope right here to purchase a shirt. The deadline for t-shirt order is going to be Monday, June 4th, and you need to get your order in because we will only have this one order for t-shirts, and we ask that you would let everybody and their mother know what's going on. T-shirt envelopes are available in the office and on the table going into the sanctuary there, and that is about all the announcements I have. We had 90, 96, 46. We had 46. I'm sorry, Pastor. I just disappointed yes, you. <laughs> Ministerial speaking, we had 300 make decisions in discipleship training tonight. 300 people decided to uh, stay home. Anyways, uh, we did have 46. That is a terrible seminary joke. Uh, we did have 46 uh, in discipleship training tonight. And I would, I would like to share just a little bit about what we discussed in uh, youth tonight. As you know, we've been going through the book of Romans. And we talked about uh, Romans verse eight, chapter 1, verse 18. And basically, I want to read the, the 22nd and 23rd verse. Paul writes that professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. And I, and I use the illustration, you know, would you rather have a diamond that is worth millions of dollars our penny. You know, the salvation that we have in Christ, that gift that has been so 
freely given to us by the outpouring of his blood on the cross and the resurrection, that is a diamond. To know God is worth eternally more than any diamond or any precious jewel on the face of this planet. And yet so often we trade them for pennies. We trade what is eternal, what is valuable, what is going to last for all eternity for that which only lasts a little while and that which does not add any value to our eternities and most time even our lives. So next time when you're faced with a decision, ask yourself, am I trading my diamond for a penny? Would you join your hearts with me in prayer? Father, we do come before you recognizing that you are a good, good, good God. And we come here to recognize you. We come here to worship you. We thank you, God, for allowing us to have this opportunity. God, we thank you for your son dying upon that cross so that we may be saved and restored and redeemed. Father, I pray that you would help us to walk that walk as well as talk that talk. Help us to know your word in a deeper and deeper way. God, help us to spend more time in prayer and help us, Father, to put first things first. Help us to glorify you, to honor you, because you are worthy of all adoration and praise. God, we pray that tonight you would set hearts on fire for you, that by your Holy Spirit the Christian would be encouraged, the sinner would be convicted, and that they would be led to repent of their sins and to place their trust in you. We thank you so much for what Jesus has done on the cross. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. All right. And during this time, I know I've got a lot of my mouth and lips in this time. I'm going to ask our kindergarten graduates to come forward at this time. If your uh, mother would like to accompany you or your dad would like to accompany you, that is more than okay. So, Mr. Nathan, Mr. Connor, Mr. Cameron, come on down. Oh, yeah, come on. Come on, Cam. Come stand right here beside me. Yeah. There we go, little buddy. And uh, I'm actually going to need a hand with these. Would one of y'all give me a hand? Thank you so much. All right, so we're, we're going to do, because we love our kindergartners, and we recognize that they are such special and unique individuals, we decided that we were going to have a little, uh, a little quiz show for y'all, okay? So I'm just going to ask you a question. One Really easy question. I just want you to answer it as best as you can. Can you do that for me? Can you do that, Cam? All right, so Cameron, what do you want to be when you grow up? A lawnmower person. A lawnmower person. That's what I'm talking about. That is awesome. Will we give Cameron a, uh, <laughs> put that around Cameron's neck. Man, that is awesome. Mr. Connor, what do you want to be when you grow up? baseball player. That's what I'm talking about. And Mr. Nathan, what do you want to be when you grow up? A Texas game warden. A Texas game warden. That is what I'm talking about. Well, before y'all uh, before y'all head back to your seats, let me pray for y'all, and then we're going to move forward. Okay, guys? We're going to bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these, these young boys. We pray that you would watch over them that you would keep them safe. God, that you would make it so to where they could learn more and more about you and how good you are and how much you love them. God, I pray for their parents. I pray for their families. God, that you would bless them and keep them. God, that you would draw them closer to you. And God, we thank you so much for this opportunity we have to gather together to recognize their, uh, their graduation from kindergarten to the first grade. We thank you so much, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray these things. Amen. Amen. Y'all give these uh, little fellas a round of applause one time. Y'all go on back to your seats now. Good evening. Let's stand together. We'll go ahead and have, uh, go ahead and have our offertory hymn, hymn number 264, if you would stand. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. 
Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb, seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns, you reign victorious. High and treasure of heaven crucified worthy is the Lamb dear Lord thank you for this day and thank you for letting us get to come here and worship you God I ask that you would help everybody that needs your comfort or healing, God, and I ask that you would help Brother Tim as he brings the message, and I ask that you would bless us all from this in my prayer, amen. Thank you very much for being here tonight. I appreciate you coming. Tonight I want to go down to the potter's house in Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6. I remember preaching my first pastorate, preaching on the potter's house. Are you the potter or are you the clay? Jeremiah 18 and verse 1 through 6. You'll need to keep your Bibles open throughout the message as we reference and look back on this passage of Scripture. We're going to look for a while here at this passage, are you the potter or the clay? In Jeremiah 18, verses 1 through 6. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. And then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he remade it into another vessel, as it pleased the potter to make. And then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does? Declares the Lord, Behold the clay in the potter's hand, so as you in my hand, O house of Israel, you are in my hand. Let us pray. Father, I pray you would bless the reading of your word. Help us to preach with clarity tonight and conviction. Father, I pray that we will clear our minds of all of the different things that clutter our mind right now about this week and things that may be bothering us. I just pray that you would help us, Lord, to sit and learn and listen from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are you the potter or are you the clay? There's a, a very vast difference between the potter and the clay. 
you have uh, the potter's the one who mixes and he forms the clay and then you have the clay of its material that's molded in the hands of the potter and so by definition clay is nothing more than any earth that forms a paste with with water and it hardens when you heat it up or when it's dried and so you know we're made since we're made from from the dust of the ground I don't think that anybody would argue the point that we are clay in Genesis 2 7 it says and the Lord God formed man of the, of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and became a living soul in order to preach on this subject I had to think a little bit about the potter and the clay and try to have an understanding better of this I learned two valuable lessons concerning the potter and the clay first of all we're gonna look at the clay in order to make clay that's usable you have to start with just the right mixture of earth and and water and if there's too much water in the clay it's gonna to be too wet and it won't harden and then if it's too soft it's gonna to be too weak to be able to hold up and you can't form anything out of it and so if it's too dry of course we all know that it probably will crumble fall apart and you have to have the right combination the two ingredients which is clay and water to be able to use and so in order to be able to, for this clay to be useful so that's the clay then you have the hands that work inside of this clay once you've mixed the right amounts of both the water and dust or the earth that clay has to be kneaded or it has to be worked with the hands in order to incorporate the ingredients or mix them together and so the reason for the kneading process is twofold now you must get all the air bubbles out if you're familiar with kneading what kneading means air pockets that are left inside of the clay what would happen is going to cause the the piece to explode when it's being fired inside of the kill or the big oven and so grit may be inside of the clay and any grit that you have inside of the clay uh, or particles there it's going to cause some imperfections when this potter begins to try to use his hands and it will weaken and it'll fall apart when after he throws it on the wheel and so the potter can feel as he begins to work with his clay he can feel the imperfections or these different kind of things that does not belong there inside of that clay with his hands and so how many of you have ever kneaded dough in order to make some uh, a pie or bread how many of you ever needed something several of you have and so it's the same principle you try to get the air out of it and you want to make sure that there's no imperfections there and so you have to knead the dough until it's easy enough to work with and so God wanted to make something beautiful out of Israel and so it is we have here in Jeremiah 18 and we're looking at verse 1 through 6 God sent this great man Jeremiah to the potter's house to teach him and to teach us tonight many lessons concerning the potter's house and the clay and so one of the primary reasons for sending Jeremiah down was that God is the potter Jeremiah is the clay and so this is a lesson that we need to learn today another another way of saying is that God is God and that we are his creation and so often many times we people may live their life as if God is our creation and trying to mold him and to try to shape him and make him do what we want him to do but the problem with a lot of folks and this is a big problem before a problem can be corrected we have to first recognize that there's a problem and there was a man that woke up one morning to find there was a big old puddle of water inside of his king-size waterbed and so in order to fix this puncture inside this waterbed he he rolled this heavy mattress outdoors and he filled it with more water so he could locate with a leak and see if it was going to spring more water out of it and so this humongous all it is a big bag of water and so it was so impossible to control it began to roll down a, a, a hill it was very hilly and it stopped at the bottom of the hill and there was a big bush it landed in a clump of bushes and just poked holes all in it so the guy was aggravated he threw it out he just said you know we'll just drag it off and not use that so he put an actual normal bed inside of his uh, home there and so the next morning he woke up and he found that in the puddle of water again and the, was in the middle of his bed and so what he discovered is that upstairs there was a bathroom that he had that had a, a leaky drain and so it's been proven over and over before you can fix a problem you have to to identify what that problem is if you go to a person that fixes computers you go to a person that works on cars they will tell you that they will try to locate the problem and that's one of the hardest things to do is to locate the problem 
And so throughout the scripture, God used a lot of things to teach spiritual truths. We know that he used fish and trees and he used uh, boats and stones and water and a lot of things. And so in this case, in this passage of scripture tonight, we're looking at, we know that he used clay. And so the Lord was going to use something that the people of Jeremiah's generation was very familiar with. He was going to use the local potter. With that said, let's move into this message tonight and see what God's word has to say. First of all, we have the potter's house in verses 1 and 2, if you look there. Making pottery was a very popular trade in Bible days. And God wanted Jeremiah to tell Israel how God wanted to, to work to make his people a beautiful vessel. And when Jeremiah arrived at the potter's house, there was a number of things that Jeremiah laid his eyes on. He saw the potter's house. It was a place of labor where he molded and he shaped beautiful vessels. But he also saw the potter's wheel, and there it was that he placed a large portion of clay there on that wheel to be molded and to become from that clay something useful. He saw the potter's seat where that potter would sit there and he would, as if he was riding a bicycle, he would push his, with his feet, he would pedal and it would make that wheel spin so he could be able to work with a clay. And he saw the potter's hands that took those soft pliable clay and from that clay pit and, and as the wheel spun, he would throw it on there and he would use his skillful hands and you have to be very careful and to put some amount of pressure at just the right time in order to be able to make something beautiful. He also saw there there was an oven something that you put clay in to make it harder. And so it was, once the vessels were molded and shaped the way he wanted them, and they was placed under a lot of heat, under intense heat, and they hardened. And this is what was down at the potter's house. But then you would have the potter's hands. And Jeremiah, if you look in verses 1 through 4, looking at the potter at work is a, a picture of the Lord. He's working and he's shaping and he's molding our life. And a lot of people today in our society, we placed our lives in the hands of a lot of people. Say, Lady Luck, I've heard people say that before. We often hear people say, uh, good luck. You know, there's golfers who feel that they use a certain golf ball that they're going to have luck. There's some people that carry a rabbit's foot around. And Have you ever wondered if that's a lucky rabbit's foot, why would the rabbit not so lucky? You ever wondered that before? It, you know, a lot of people think it brings good luck. Some people, they have a cross around their neck. And they think, well, maybe this cross is going to be, uh, bring me good luck. One man said that during the wintertime that he wore the same underclothes the whole winter long. He thought it helped him never catch a cold. I guess after a while he smells so bad that even the germs didn't want to get close to him. The Bible doesn't teach us that wearing the cross is good luck. In fact, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that to be executed on a cross was a curse. In Genesis, Galatians 3.13, it says that curse of anyone that hangs on a cross our lives are not in the hands of, of, of a lady luck as we would have, a lot of people would have us to believe. We're in the hands of God. In Psalm 20, 37, 23, and many times I've prayed for many of you, and this is where I get this phrase from, that God, and especially when I'm praying for children, I pray that God would order your steps. This passage of Scripture in Psalm 37, 23, it says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And I'm here to tell you that he'll decide. God's the one that's going to decide. If we'll get up in the morning, he's going to decide how hot it's going to be, if the sun's going to shine, if it's going to rain or not, if it's going to be windy or not. And it's not Lady Luck that's in control, it's God. And there's people who believe that our entire life is built on good luck or bad luck. What's that old saying, if I didn't have it, uh, bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all? I think they used to say that on Hee Haw. I think that's what they used to say. But that's not so. Our lives are not built on luck. God is the one who will mold your life and shape it just as the potter molds and shapes the clay into what he wants it to become. We see the potter's house and we see the potter's hands, but we also see the potter's heart. In verse number six there, God can do with us as God sees fit. He was that, he has that right because he's the one that has created us and that we're his creation. And when Jeremiah went to the potter's house, he saw tall vessels and he saw short vessels and he saw different colored vessels and he saw different shaped vessels and the potter made those vessels and he shaped them and he molded them and he fashioned those vessels in the way that the potter wanted those vessels to be formed. And so it is, is that we all know that God shapes us. Oh, we all probably all know people we wish we could be molded and shaped to look like or, or, or be like or something like that. That reminds me of the little girl. She was sitting on her grandpa's lap. And she was rubbing his face and his nose and his ears and, and his mouth. And she said, Granddad, did God create you? And he said, well, of course, honey, created me. Why, why do you ask that? And she said, well, looking at you and looking at me, he did a better job on me than he did you. 
we have to remember that God knew what he was doing when he created you, when he created me. We might not know what he was doing, but he knew what he was doing. We might not even like the way that he shaped us and molded us, but we need to remember he's the potter. We are the clay. Many of us can remember in school when the in class, and I remember these people. I admired them a lot of times. We'd be taking a test, and they'd be going through. They would zip through that, at that test. There was blanks. They would fill them out. They would turn that test in. They'd pass them back out after they was graded. Those folks had seemingly got up and left out and made straight A's. The rest of us was just sitting there scratching our head trying to guess at a lot of the answers. I've been there before. Sometimes, and we know that, but God knew what he was doing when he created every one of us. I'm here to tell you that God created us and has every right to do so with what he chooses to do with us. We are clay in God's hands. We see the potter's house and we see the potter's hands and we see the potter's heart, but I also want you to notice the potter's honor. And he saw all the beautiful vessels that the potter had shaped there. They had already been placed in the oven and they were complete, that was finished. And he also noticed over there there was a vessel that had to be remade. It had defects in it and the potter, he had to take the clay and he had to place it back on that spinning wheel and he had to take his hands and he had to reshape that vessel. And it was only when it was completed to his satisfaction that it was placed in that oven and it was there, it was dried, and it was hardened. Aren't you glad that God is a God of second chances? Won't you agree with that tonight? Amen. God offers a new beginning to marred vessels, to vessels that are ruined. Notice in verse 4, if you're following along in chapter 18 of Jeremiah, no matter how bad that you feel about yourself, God can remake your life. God gives you second chances. As somebody said, he allows you turns. There's people in our society who will give you only one chance, and if you blow it, that's all. But God can take a shattered life, and as the master potter, he can remake it, and he can reshape our lives, and he can give us another chance. He, God can take a broken life and remake people if they will only give him a chance. You know, Satan has made a mess out of a lot of people's lives. But God can take something that's broken, and he can make it useful. There was a new hair salon that opened up for business across the street from an old established uh, hair cutter. And the new place put a big sign up in the window, and a sign read this, we give $7 haircuts. Well, the old hair cutter, the master barber, wasn't going to be outdone. He sat down and he made him up a sign, and he put it in his window, and it said, we fix $7 haircuts. Maybe your life has been messed up, but God can fix it if you'll come to him. Before I close tonight, I want to ask you what I ask you at the beginning of this sermon tonight, and that is this. Are you the potter or are you the clay? I hope you can recognize that we visited the potter's house. I want you, you remember that course? I know Eric does. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall upon me fresh on me. God can take lemons and make lemonade in a person's life. God truly can make something of a shattered mess if we'll only give him a chance. Yes, there may be scars, there may be things that hurt, but you see, he's the master potter, and you're the lump of you're going to give God the opportunity tonight that he wants to help you. Some of us may have some imperfections in our life that need to be shaped up. Give God the chance to make you into the vessel that's useful to him. Let us pray. Father, thank you for giving us a second chance. Father, we know one day this life will be over we're going to go out into eternity it's not some fairy tale for we know that there's a living soul and we know that it'll go out into eternity and father until that time help us to be that lump of clay that's willing to be used even if we have to be put on the potter's wheel again we know with all of the indentations and the
pressure and the heat from the furnace sometimes, we know it'll make us stronger and a useful vessel for the Lord. I pray if there's somebody here tonight that needs to make things right in their life, I pray they would do it tonight. In Jesus' name. as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot if you would have been seated for just a minute please um, we try to time this so we wouldn't be too late getting out tonight and we also have deacons meeting and they tend to run along sometimes too so uh, many of you probably have had the opportunity to see what we're about to show you uh, but Brenda and I had the opportunity to meet this guy and uh, we heard him in person and this is a little bit aged presentation from several years back but this is a guy that's been doing this a long I want you to listen as this master craftsman, artisan, works with clay. This was at the Passion Play. And we met this guy back some months ago. And I said, if I ever have the opportunity to share this with our people, I want to do that. So Brennan and I bought this DVD. It was about a 20-minute presentation. And I want you to really zero and hone in on what this guy's saying. And it, he made the Bible just like come to life. I'm like, wow. And uh, it was just misty-eyed all over the place, so many people. It was just, a, you know, not a huge bunch of folks there, but probably about maybe 50 to 100 folks. So, But if, Tim, if you will, unmute that, and if you will, uh, dim the lights, and uh, we're going to share this with you. Hi, folks. Sure good to have all of you come over for a while. I know you're here to see the Passion Play tonight, and hope you're very blessed by seeing the play. I remember a long time ago when I saw the play for the first time. I, that night I left, my heart was very stirred for the Lord, and I hope the same thing might happen with each one of you tonight, as well as through this presentation. I know most of you probably have seen people work on a potter's wheel before, but we're going to look at it a little differently, though, instead of talking about regular pottery terms through a presentation, we're going to look at how clay would relate to scripture and see what we can pull out from the scripture that might relate to us. And I hope you find it interesting anyway. The pieces of pottery here on the platform, they're referred to as vessels to a potter, like we have often been referred to as vessels unto the Lord. And we're taking a look between the two the whole time. I know that if you looked up today in the dictionary, some of the different definitions you'll find for clay are definitions that will range all the way from the heavenly body, the human body, the human flesh, the same natural elements in this clay are the very same exact ones that we have here in this clay. There's just one difference, and that's that 
we have the breath of life that's been breathed into us. You see potter's clay, basically, when it's all said and done and all the chemical contents are taken down, they find that it's nothing but dust and water. We know dust to be symbolic of man in the scripture, and water is the spirit of God. It was Job that said, from dust I came, and dust I'll return. And most of us out here are aware that Adam, he was created from the dust of the ground, and God breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and he became a living soul. But it was in some of the different translations that come out of the scripture there in Genesis 2, 7. Instead of saying that he was created from the dust of the ground, it says that he was created from the terracotta of the ground. And terracotta is clay much like this. It means the word red earth. And when I found that out, I thought that would be quite interesting. I knew it wasn't just a coincidence. But this clay, in order for it to become useful to me, it does have to be in the proper balance. You see, if I have too much... For an example, too much water into the clay, at first it will make it a lot easier to work with, I have to admit, especially when I'm trying to center it here on the potter's wheel. But to go anything beyond the centering process and trying to build the vessel up to get some height out of it, that excess water will cause so much freedom to the clay that the vessel, it will fall right back down. It will collapse because it well, lacked that stability that it needed to stand that firm and solid. Now on the opposite end, if I had too much of the dust into this clay, this would tend to get very hardened. I like to call it stubborn and strong-willed. You know, I won't listen to my reason. Y'all ever known anyone like that, maybe? No. <laughs> Occasionally we have people out here point at one another, getting in a lot of trouble, you know. <laughs> we can all be like that, but more importantly, we'd be pliable into the hands of the Lord. The basis for much of this presentation you'll hear about, though, this evening comes in the scripture in Psalm 40. The first verse of Psalm 40 says that he inclined to me and he heard my cry. He took me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay. That passage of scripture there in Psalm 40 is referring to a natural clay pit, which it's a large hole that's in the ground. Potters will go down inside to get their clay. You see, down in the very bottom of the clay pit itself is where the miry clay is, and it's very good and desirable for a potter to use, but it's not what you take note of the most. When you're in the pits, what you become aware of quite quickly, more than anything else, will be the darkness that will surround you. Everywhere you look, you see nothing but the darkness except one place. And that's when you look up out of the pit, up out of that darkness, you can see the light flooding down the hole just a little ways. I know if you go into a natural clay pit today, though, chances in most cases will look very, very slim for you to ever get up out of them because the walls inside of that natural clay pit, they're slick. And, well, it's almost impossible to climb up out of one by yourself. Normally, you'd only have one alternative. If you wanted to get up out of the pit, you're going to have to cry out of that pit for some help and hope that a good friend of yours might be nearby that would hear your cry and come help you up out of that pit, up out of that darkness. You see, to me, I believe the clay pit to be an awfully lot like the spiritual pit. I know before I came to know the Lord, I was in the pits. I was in the darkness where it seemed to surround me everywhere I looked. But I'll never forget that one day when I looked up out of that darkness, and if you would, I saw the light. It was a light of Jesus Christ, of course. And I had always heard from when I was a little boy that he was a good friend of mine. I cried out to that good friend that day, and I'll never forget what happened in return. For you see, he did the same thing as said in that passage of Scripture in Psalm 40. When I cried out to him, he inclined to me, and he heard my cry. He took me up out of that horrible pit, up out of that darkness. And for the first time in my life, I felt the hands of the Lord come upon me. And I hope that each one of you here can say, you know I've also felt those same hands come upon me too. It makes a great deal of difference in our lives. But it continues on there in that passage of Scripture in Psalm 40. It will go on into the second and third verse to say that he set my foot upon a rock and established my going. He's put a new psalm in my mouth, even praises to our God, and many shall see it and fear it and trust in the Lord. Throwing the lump of clay down here on the potter's wheel, in essence, I've just set its foot upon a rock and I've established its going. For you see, to better understand that passage of Scripture, back in the Bible days, potters worked on a couple different type of potter's wheels that I'm aware of. One type of potter's wheel, the potter, he would actually stand up beside of it. And about waist height, there was a large rock that he would take and spin it with his hand to get it to go. As it was going around, he'd work on it. Another type of potter's wheel was more like this one here, consisted of two rocks. There was a large rock down at the bottom, close to the ground. The potter would kick it with his leg to get it to go smaller rock up here at the tops where he did all of his work. The bottom of this lump of clay is called the foot. So you can see how that passage of scripture would have really taken light in reference to where it says, he set my foot upon a rock and established my going. The bottom of all these vessels here on this platform is called the foot. Yeah, just like the bottom of all these vessels out here. You know, 
see some pretty good sized platforms out here on a few of you. <laughs> Our feet, though, they have to be established on the rock of Jesus Christ. And even more importantly than that, he wants us to be centered on the rock. You see, if we're not centered on the rock, I, I think we can be much like this lump of clay. This lump of clay is off-center. The way you can tell that is when I place my hands upon it, it's going to take and toss my hands back and forth or to and fro. This fights against me. At this point, it really doesn't want to have a lot to do with me. I've often liked to refer to something like this as a self-centered lump. You know, it's kind of going about its own way. It has its own desire. It's full of itself here. If you try to make a vessel out of a self-centered lump of clay, most generally what will happen to it is when you start to build the walls of the vessel up, one side of the wall will be a lot thicker than the other side. And a lot of times in the actual drying process of that vessel, the side that's thickest can cause so much stress and friction on the side that's thin that the vessel will crack on you. That's what a lot of the potters, at least here in Arkansas, we all like to refer to as a crack pot. Now, we don't want to be like that, do we? But you'll note a lot of difference will take place here in just a short moment. Much like we as individuals, when the true hands of the Lord come upon us, we won't be the same any longer. We will be changed. Now, in order to center this lump of clay, I first will have to get it going at a much higher rate of speed. And to achieve the speed, I kick this large stone down here at the bottom of the potter's wheel. I've had many people over the years comment how much it looks like I pump or pedal something back here, but I kick right on the top of the stone. The stone's quite heavy. You know, it weighs between four and 500 pounds. It's been a great source of exercise for me. This one leg of mine's a lot bigger than the other one. No, a couple days ago, I went outside to run for a little while, and I kept finding myself going around and around. You know. And note the difference here real quickly. Now, visually, you'll see the difference happen to this right away. Just like we as individuals. When the true hands of the Lord come upon us, and others look at us, I believe they'll see the visual difference right away, too. They'll notice the change in us. Note the difference, though. Now that this is centered, remembering what it was like a moment ago and what it's like now. When I place my hands upon it, you see, there's no more fighting me. No more tossing my hands back and forth or to and fro. Reminds me a great deal of the scripture that talks about be still and know that I am God. We all know this lump of clay is moving quite rapidly here in my hands, but in essence it is still because it never fights outside the circumference of my hands. A great majority of this lump of clay is now held here in the palm of the hand like we as individuals need to be in his hands, resting in the hands of Christ. For you see, as we do, he creates inside of each one of us a new heart. The inside of all these vessels here on the platform is called the heart of the vessel, just like inside of us. And Since this has been so still in my hands, I don't have any alternative than to go right down inside of it and give it a heart. It does say in the scripture that the word of God pierces directly through our heart. And that's exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm piercing directly through the heart of this vessel. We need the word piercing through us today. It's very good for us to have the word deep down inside of us. But I don't want to stop here. Although we could stop at this point, we could be done with this. We could call it a vessel and be finished. But it would be real sad because this has so much more potential than this. Oh, well, this has a heart, but the heart is small and it's very shallow. It has great big thick walls. I want it to continue on. I want it to grow, just as the Lord's desire for us is the same today. I don't think he wants us to reach a certain point in our walk with him, and then we perhaps become contented or satisfied, but, but that we would also continue on, that we would grow. I've often found the result to be very much the same. As this vessel continues on with me, just as we continue on with the Lord, our heart will become larger. The larger the heart we have, the more good things inside of us are going to be able to contain. I want this to have many good things inside. So for the next few moments, I'm going to build this vessel up. I like to call it giving it edification. Edification means to build up. We all know the opposite of building something up, of course, would be to tear it down. And I've found that most people in life today feel a lot better being built up and being torn down. I think that all of you here would agree with that. At the same time I build this vessel up, I give the clay some discipline. Much like the Lord does us as we grow in him, we are disciplined in him. Oh, I have to admit, discipline doesn't always feel good, but it is good for us. 
Anything that's really worthwhile today in life requires a great amount of discipline. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort and energy to learn how to do much of anything, just like it does to get to know the Lord. We have to discipline ourselves to get to know Him, spend time with Him, and put out that effort and energy. I communicate with this clay at the very same time I build it up, give it some discipline, I communicate with it when I place my hands upon it. One of the wonderful things about this clay is that it always responds to my communication. It always responds to my hands. I think that's a great lesson for us to learn today as well. When we feel the true hands of the Lord come upon us, that we would be much like the clay, that we would respond to his hands, to his communication, you know, to the nudging of his spirit. As I work myself on up here toward the very top of this vessel, top of the vessel is referred to as the lip or the mouth of the vessel. It does say in the scripture that out of the lip or the mouth, both blessing and cursing can come. I honestly believe today in life we can have relationships that have been built up and edified for years, and it only takes us but a few short moments to tear those relationships down to nothing just by what we would say through these things here. We can communicate destruction quite rapidly in life today. And most generally, when something's been destroyed, it takes a long time to repair the damage after it's been done. It takes a great length of time for you to see there's usually a lengthy healing process that will have to take place in the heart of mankind. So we should always be real careful what we would say to one another that, well, that we don't ever have to repair damage after it's been done. And over the last several years, I've had many different people come up and comment to me that sometimes the ones they have the hardest time communicating with, oddly enough, are people that they love the most. Sometimes we get so comfortable around people that we love, we're more apt to let our guards drop, and we say things that tend to cut deep down within the heart and cause much destruction. We should really guard against that, especially among people we love and that we care for so much today. I believe that's a cause of many, many breakdowns in our relationships today in this society. I know that as each one of you view this vessel, though, from different points of view, each one of you have a different angle that you see this vessel from, but yet all of you see this a lot differently than I do. As you look down upon this vessel from different areas, your eyes are fixed to see only what's on the outside. But as a creator of this vessel, when I look down upon it, my eyes are fixed to see through the heart. I think that's how our Lord sees us today. Man looks upon the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. He sees everything inside of us. I know that all of you could see the heart of this vessel as well as I could, but to do that, you would have to draw nigh unto me. We have that same desire in our lives today to see the heart of mankind. I think that's the key that, that we might draw nigh unto the Lord. The closer we grow to him, the closer we'll all grow to one another. And we might get so close to someone that just perhaps we'll get a glimpse of what they're holding inside. And by chance, if someone's going through some difficult times in life, I really believe we'd be able to see that right away. I think we would hopefully discern that and try to respond to them and help them and care for them. I know this vessel at this point is going through a time where it's carrying around a lot of burden, a lot of heaviness, and a lot of load. I know about this one here. But I'm not certain about all of you out here. There could be some of you going through the same where you feel burdened down with things that have been weighing heavy against you. You might feel a tremendous load upon your shoulders. And I know it's always easier said than done today in this lifetime, but the only way I've ever found that we can get rid of our burdens is when we would lay them down before the feet of the Lord. He's the only one that can take them away. Just as I'm going to take this burden away here. You know, this reminds me a bit of a song that sometimes we'll sing in church. It talks about how burdens are lifted at Calvary. Truly, he did lift our burdens on Calvary. And when the burden has been lifted, as the scripture would say, the load will be made lighter and lighter. Just like this right here. Note the difference. When the burden's being lifted, the load being made lighter. For you see, as a result, this vessel here, it, it won't be so weighed down and heavy anymore. The result's the same with us today. 
He's the only one that can take these burdens away. But this isn't a vessel yet, although it might look a lot like one. In order for this to become a vessel, it's going to have to go through the fire. If, if we try to pick it up right now, most of us know what would happen to this. Any outward pressure whatsoever on this vessel at this point would cause this vessel to collapse. It only has enough strength to stand up on its own and nothing more. It's vital that it goes through the fire before it can really become a useful vessel. I'll let it dry out, then I'll place it in a potter's kiln, which are large ovens you put the pottery into. I'll fire this up to a temperature into the oven to about 2,400 degrees. It will get so hot at the height of that temperature that it almost melts down and it just about gives up because you see it's going to barely be able to stand the heat that comes against it. And we go through the same in life today. We refer to them as the fiery trials and tribulations. And I believe on many occasions in our lives we get to the point where we feel a lot like the clay, where we feel like we're about ready to melt down and we're just about ready to give up because we can barely stand the heat that comes against us. All of us in life will encounter fiery trials and tribulations. I know some of us will have to go through a great deal more than others. I work a lot with small children, and I know that some of those children are only five, six, seven years old. And bless their hearts, some of those children have been through more than most people will go through already in a lifetime. It's hard to understand. Some things we won't understand. I believe some things in our life will remain a mystery to all of us. We won't know until that day. But we can't give up our hope in Him. No matter what the cost might be that we would continue on, as the Scripture would say, to let us hold fast to the confessions of our faith without wavering. For when we come through the fire, we can have the assurance of knowing this one thing. We will no longer represent a vessel like this one here that at this point could easily be crushed down. No, when we come through the fire, we'll come through the fire representing vessels much like these here on the platform. We're at the height of the temperature, the 2,400 degrees. These go through what we call a purification process. And all the tiny particles of clay, they will fuse together to become a solid rock. On Christ the rock we do stand today. Now, I have one particular vessel up here on this platform. I feel very much would characterize what the Lord would want from each one of us. And it's all summed up in the cup. Cups were created to serve. That's why they were made. This cup is almost filled up to overflowing, yet I know if it always stayed full, it would have never served the purpose that it was created for. And we all know that this was created to quench thirst. The only way this could ever quench anyone's thirst would be when it would pour its heart out for an individual. That's the only way we'll ever be able to quench the thirst of mankind today in this lifetime, I believe, is, is when we would do the same for one another. I've always found as you empty yourself out, our Lord seems to be there quite quickly to fill your cups back up again and again to overflowing. As the scripture would say, be ye servants unto the Lord. I have many different vessels here on this platform. Most of these vessels date back almost from the very beginning when I started working with pottery years ago. In essence, they would represent years of work. Each one of these have a very special meaning to me. But none of them are alike. Some are different in shape, some in size, and some in color. And every time I've ever done this presentation, I always have the same thing I hear in front of me. I see many years of work. God's workmanship. All of us are very special unto the eyes of the Lord, and yet we are different. Some in shape, some in size, some in color. I think the Lord wants a lot of different vessels in his household today, so if you would, there could be many great things prepared for the kingdom of God. And maybe as you've been viewing this presentation, one of these vessels might stand out to you above another as your personal favorite. I wanted to share the one I would choose, if I could only choose one. It would be the choice of a lifetime for me. It's the one I work out of here to my side. If we based our opinion only by what we were to see on the outside, this may very well look the least among them all. 
It might even be the last one left over out of the crowd. But it's the most special of all because out of the heart of this vessel, all of the others were created. Many, many thousands more very similar to them. And you can tell by looking at it, you see it's had to go through a lot for them. Just as our Lord did for each one of us that we might become who we are today. He went through a lot for us. You see, the whole time this vessel here has been made, I'm sure many of you have noted, but this vessel has been pouring part of its heart out for me over and over again. But you see, this one only stopped part of the way. It only gave part of its heart. And that's the difference today. For you see, some 2,000 years ago in time, as our mind races back, to our Lord Jesus that was on the cross. Some of the final words he said was, it is finished. And he paid the price. He laid his life down for us. And at the same time, he gave us the ultimate gift of love when he gave us his heart. He kept pouring it out for us over and over again until he had no more left to give. He gave it all. Yes, when he was on the cross, we were on his mind. And I find and become more and more convinced of this one thing each and every day that I work with clay, that all he wants from us simply lies here within the clay. There are two quality elements that he longs for his people today, and it's right here within the clay. The clay has always been a yielding and an always surrendering substance to my hands. Are we that way today to his hands? For you see, only as we yield and we surrender our lives over to the hands of the Lord can then he in his marvelous handiwork take each one of us and truly shape us, mold us, mend us, form us, and fashion us into the vessel he would desire. I want to be shaped by those hands. I hope that each one of you do here as well. An occasional question I ask from time to time, and I feel it's a very fitting question for all of us to ask ourselves. The question goes as this. Lord, have I gotten to the point where I'm no longer pliable to your hands? Have I resisted your call? Have I gone the other direction? We must follow the way of the Lord and his direction today in our lives. It's the only direction we want. And perhaps if our heart's truly saying and hearing the words, simply saying to us, believe, receive all the promises I have for you, you must respond to his call. There's a scripture in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It says there that this treasure is held in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of man, that all that we would do would glorify the Lord in a more powerful way to further advance his kingdom. Jeremiah 18, when the Lord told Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house and there he'd cause him to hear his words, it was recorded there that the potter never said a word. Jeremiah received his instruction because he listened to the voice that came from God. And in all that we do today, if we will listen to that voice, we truly can become a people that will be firmly established and centered on the rock of Jesus Christ. We can't shake up a foundation like that. It would be my hope for the short time that we've all been together that Perhaps that one that spoke to Jeremiah has spoken to your heart. The one that breathed the breath of life into Adam, that he's breathed something a bit refreshing and renewing to you in your life. And that the words you've heard would have meant a lot more to you than this piece of pottery. I appreciate you coming over and sharing your time with me and your company. I hope that you've been blessed. Thank you. God bless you. I'm going to ask if you would, let's stand for a closing prayer. I'm going to ask uh, Terry Robertson to close us in a wonderful